Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of Pencil It In, a sports business series talking about the past, present, and future of the industry. I'm here with head of sports marketing at PepsiCo, Justin Toman. He oversees everything um, in terms of the company's food and beverage portfolio, ranging from deals with leagues, teams, and media. Justin, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jacob. Really appreciate it. Yeah, so, I mean, this is an absolutely crazy time. And as somebody that is heavily involved in the industry and PepsiCo has major deals across the NHL, um, NBA and NFL, as well as other smaller leagues, but those are the major ones that I know of. What was your reaction when the sports world shut down uh, early March and kind of what, how did you have to pivot in that scenario? What did that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it was disbelief, I think probably like everybody else, it was, you know, unfathomable for something like that to happen. Never had been contemplated, never had happened before. Um, and you just had nothing to equate it to, right? We, we, nobody was really prepared. It was cer certainly by definition of shock to the system for everybody. And so I think it was disbelief at, at the beginning. And then um, I think you, everybody thought it was very temporary, right? Um, and, and maybe it's a few weeks or maybe even, you know, oh my gosh, in a worst case scenario, like a month, and then things restart. But then as the days and weeks and now months have gone on, we've all realized that it is a longer term situation and we're all having to navigate through it. But, um, you know, I have a lot of empathy and empathy for um, our, our team and league and athlete partners. I mean, yes, we are, we're all affected. Um, but man, sports has been almost disproportionately affected just because the nature of the business is, is live events and live, live, you know, people, Butts and seats and people in stands and fans, you know, in stadiums. So it's um, it's been a tremendous disruption. I think there's been some great innovation. Uh, you know, that, that fans and 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 teams and sponsors will be, uh, like us have pivoted to, to kind of account for it. But man, it, it just kind of upends everything. It turns your whole sports strategy upside down and really does cause you to rethink almost every element of what you were doing and how you were engaging with fans. So in a way it's, it is this uh, tremendous shock to the system, but it's also been, you know, if I take the silver lining approach, um, it's, it's helped us kind of take a step back and reevaluate what we are really doing and what the true value is and, and how do we better engage with fans in this new environment. And I'm sure one kind of big route of marketing for PepsiCo is when you're at a game, for one of those leagues I mentioned, and you go to buy a soda product um, or a bag of chips, it's gonna be PepsiCo. So you're really getting the product um, marketing there. And then maybe stadium hospitality and signage as well. How have you looked to shift some of that spend um, to digital or social media when it really had to be uh, done very quickly to, to try to accumulate as much value back as possible? Yeah, it was, it's been a process and we're, we've gone through it. We're still going through it. I'll, I think um, maybe coining the term make good 2.0, right? We're now entering the second cycle of this. I think we, everybody has pretty much pivoted and, and accounted for 2020, but now as basketball and hockey start up and baseball on the heels of those two, you know, early in, in the new year, um, we'll be having these conversations again, right? There's just no way around it. You have to somehow account for the changes in terms of limited or no fans and shortened seasons. So we will do that again. Um, again, in the spirit of partnership with all our teams and, and, and you know, hopefully um, with everybody aligned on what is fair and equitable and right and delivers on the intent of the partnership. Um, I have no doubt we'll get there with everybody in the best way possible. Never easy conversations, but we always approach it with partnership and empathy first and figure out. Um, yeah, I mean, we're losing the, a lot of the traditional stuff that we would purchase. Um, in a deal, which is pouring rights, and, and you know, obviously there's real uh, revenue and profit done there. If if nobody's buying beverages and snacks in the stadium, that's a real loss and hit to our business. Um, it's the loss of all the hospitality assets, tickets, and tweets that nobody can you know be in. And then it's, it's a lot of the loss of the experiential stuff. I mean, we do a ton of stuff with with many of our team partners at the stadium to engage fans in different ways. Um, whether it's an on-field or a sideline experience or a pre-game or a post-game um, experience or these plazas, you know, the Pepsi pan, uh, fan decks that we have or Pepsi Corner at stadiums or Pepsi Port, um, these great fan areas that nobody's interacting with. So we are having those conversations to pivot with teams. Um, and, uh, and we're all working from home. Um, it's my son. Um, but we're, we're pivoting and, and we're, we are trying to shift to um, the digital and social and sometimes in cases broadcast angle. Uh, and that's really where fans are engaging with um, with the teams and sports they love is 
clearly. So that's that's where we're pivoting. We're taking uh, kind of the lead from the fan, the consumer, and and going that route. I know I, um, as a fan, have definitely kind of engaged more with athletes and teams from that uh, from that kind of digital social angle. I've seen some teams like the New Orleans Saints have rolled out apps dedicated specifically to having that in stadium experience um, on game day. You guys have great partnerships with athletes um, and across teams. How have you really tapped and kind of stood alongside them in trying to go um, more through like a digital realm? Is it something you guys think about when you're developing partnerships with athletes, like looking at their social reach and kind of being authentic to your brand? How does that process look? Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, Everything now has certainly accelerated the shift to fan consumer consumption of sports but entertainment in general to uh, highly social digital and some broadcast now I, you know I think the ratings are are kind of up and down depending on a number of different factors but you would you would say digital social and broadcast are really the only ways now to consume sports um, because you can't go in most cases live right now um, athletes we look at athletes in and of themselves as you know, media entities or media companies, much like we would look at, honestly, at Facebook or a NBC or CBS or ESPN. Um, I mean, these guys and women have such massive social and digital followings. And not only the number are there, the number of eyeballs who are engaging with their, you know, Instagram posts or their tweets or whatever it might be, but the, the influence that that these athletes have over people and how they view things. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's so striking that, you know, what we're looking at, um, you know, we have a, a great partnership with Dak Prescott, for example. I mean, he's a media company unto himself in many ways, right? So we look at him in, in that way and leverage that partnership very similarly to um, how we leverage the other media property, which is, you know, awareness, engagement, um, you know, with our, with our brand and product. So it's, you know, in a way, athlete partnerships have become even more important. They were always important because they are the face of, of you know, a team or a league in many cases. Um, and fans really do now more and more follow athletes, even potentially sometimes more so than they follow a team, right? If, you, if you're a LeBron James fan, you followed him in Cleveland, you followed him in Miami, and now you're following him in LA. Um, the, this pandemic, I think, has, has almost increased the, the importance of, and the role that athletes play in, in a sponsor, in a, in a brand's um, you know, kind of marketing mix, which is pretty crazy, but uh, it, it absolutely has accelerated that trend. It's very interesting because I feel like when I grew up, and I'm, I'm sure when you did, you really kind of stuck to the teams in your area, um, maybe where like a parent was from, and athletes kind of came and gone, um, yeah. and, and you, would, you would like them, but they would become your rival, and, and you would kind of look at it like that. So to see this transition, and now I think it's only been amplified in the last um, couple of years, basketball really had a lot to do with that in free agency. It definitely changes the game um, in terms of kind of connecting with athletes, and I guess their power, not only here in the U S but internationally, these guys are superstars. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny, even college, it kind of started in college sports. Like if you were a fan of, of, you know, you know, for, for us, Michigan guys, right. Tom Brady, if you followed him, it doesn't matter what team he plays for, you're following him because he's a Michigan guy. And I think that that trend has just now um, gotten bigger to, to guys and women as they've kind of gone from pro team to pro team uh, they bring their following with them. It's a powerful economic driver for the team that uh, that lands them ultimately. Yeah, and and I know you were an athlete yourself, being a gymnast in Michigan, and and then spending some time with the Team USA gymnastics club. Like, could you imagine even having like the resources that some of these guys have, like partnering, um, like USA partner with like Open Doors, for example, to help push social content out. And there's just different programs available um, for both Olympic athletes and now players and team players as well, where they can just click a button and all of a sudden it's going to all their social handle, taking out a lot of the stress of trying to build that profile themselves. What was your perspective as an athlete in terms of like branding? Is it something you even focused on back when you were in school? I know it wasn't. I have like a dinosaur uh, thinking back to the, when I was an athlete with Michigan and, and with the U.S. Uh, gymnastics team. Yeah, I mean, I think some of those tools were just starting to come on the scene. Um, but candidly, I wasn't, you know, I was not one of the top people to even warrant any sort of following or, or leveraging things like that. But I, I'm so encouraged that athletes today are doing that. I mean, whether you're an NBA player, a WNBA player, whether you're a gymnast, it's, or, you know, a swimmer or an Olympic sports, and you look at um, the, the traditional Olympic sports versus the pro sports. Um, 
I'm so encouraged that athletes have these platforms and, and are using them really um, in, in powerful ways and impactful ways for, for good, largely good. I mean, I, you know, I think of probably 10 or 20 examples off the top of my head of an athlete who has built, you know, responsibly built a platform, built a point of view, um, and, and is, is on it, not just about their sport and what, you know, how they're training and what they're doing in terms of games or, or competitions, but social issues. I love, I love seeing athletes take a stand. I think it's, um, it's, it's a great responsibility, but also a great asset that these men and women, these athletes have now. And I'm so encouraged that many of them are, are using it for not just, um, you know, financial gain, whether it's partnering with a brand, which is, you know, in my world is, is great when you find the right athlete brand partnership, but, but things like social change, it's, it's an unbelievably powerful force for, for good. Um, and I just think it goes to show you that sports really can change the world when, when you know, used in the right way. And speaking of social change, I know you guys recently partnered with Rise um, to like empower sports fans, athletes and leaders um, in the industry to really combat racism, racism, excuse me, and promote equity and inclusion. Can you just speak a little bit about that partnership? Yeah, absolutely. We are, we are so excited and proud to partner with Rise. Um, had been working on kind of framing out the, the partnership, you know, during the summer. And so it's, it's felt really good to uh, finally announce it and get it out there. Um, although much of it now, as we turn the page to 21, we'll really bring it to life in 21. We wanted to announce it before the end of the year um, to, to get that message out there. And we're, we're so proud of it, but we really will start activating it um, in big ways in 21. You know, I think we're going to have to pivot to some extent. We, there's a lot of in-person things we wanted to do, my, like, you know, and activations like many brands and, and sport entities, the in-person stuff is not really possible, at least early on in 21. So we'll pivot to some virtual and digital stuff, but, um, you know, the in-person stuff will come along, but we're really excited about kicking that off in 21. Um, I mean, listen, it's, it's, it's a great organization. I think Stephen Ross, who founded it, was really, you know, kind of ahead of his time, so to speak. Um, a lot that happened this calendar year that, that brought a lot of the racial injustice stuff to the forefront and into pop culture, um, which is great because it's now being dealt with and acknowledged head on. Um, but I think Stephen Ross was way ahead of the curve on that. Um, and, and we're proud to partner with them now and, and do some really impactful things, both externally and fan facing, but also we're gonna bring Rise into PepsiCo um, and do some kind of employee engagement uh, things as well which you know education and, and things like that 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 rise has this core competency and so um it, it is a part of pepsico's broader initiatives um and i'm just happy and proud that we can kind of act one small part of that through through my lens through my world of sports um, because i do think it can be a powerful driver of positive change i'm very excited to see how it all plays out and it's no mistake that the miami dolphins are usually voted like one of the best places to work in the industry Stephen Ross is, is a great owner. And Proud Michigan lineage down there in Miami with Tom Garfinkel as well. You guys have the major partnerships with leagues, as I mentioned, but I think something that must be forgotten by a lot of people is kind of the esports space and like lacrosse leagues, some of these smaller um, properties that are, are really growing. Yeah. A lot of these smaller sports have picked up steam um, throughout the pandemic and just kind of shown fight and getting back on the field. What is kind of your view on esports space and, and how you guys fit into that? Um, and as well as with the professional lacrosse league, which I know is totally different than esports, but I, I've seen that you guys have done some stuff with them as well, and they've been in the news for a merger recently. Yeah, yeah, PLL, yeah. Listen, I, we're we're big fans of esports, and we're big fans of emerging things in general. I, I, listen, I think the core pro American sports will always, you know, I say always, but. Um, they occupy a lot of our attention and resources because there's just so much of a mass of fans that engage, whether it's the NFL, baseball, college basketball, you name it. I mean, there's massive millions and millions of fans, which is why a brand like Pepsi is, is leaning into those spaces because it allows us this unparalleled scale connection to, to millions of fans. When you think about esports, you know, kind of came on more recently, but man, has just gotten to that scale tipping point very quickly. And, and we're in that space, um, specifically with a, with a product called Mountain Dew Game Fuel, or kind of, you know, angling that specifically with gamers um, in that space. And it's, it's a really natural connection. We've gotten some great feedback, um, you know, for that product specifically kind of built and engineered for gamers. 
Um, so that I think that's the uh, the more kind of endemic place for our a brand like Mountain Dew Game Fuel in esports. And we try to bring that to life with some team and league partnerships. Um, more and more, we were finding that the esports influencers, who may be competitive gamers but may just be influencers, you know, in the space in their own right, um, are are a really powerful way to connect with fans again because they they have the, the scale followings. Um, and that it is, it does to fill in that always on content model. These guys are always posting, always filming, creating content, distributing. It's a really nice, um, a nice way to continually have a, a voice in the space. Um, even but things like XFL and PLL, um, which is now merging, these are these um, emerging spaces. We love to try to find the right ones and the right ways to test and learn. Um, you know, I think the PLL was one of the first organizations to really pioneer the, the helmet stickers, right? Um, I think you're going to see that in the NHL now, they've announced, yeah. right? And I think it was maybe going to happen eventually, but, you know, the pandemic accelerated it, but also the XFL showed that it could work and that brands would pay for it, right? And so I think you're going to see that more. So we're trying to find the right organization, and you can do everything, right? Resources are limited, but um, we, we try to find the, the emerging things that are out there that are going to, one, let us connect with fans in a meaningful way to drive our brand and business objectives, but to also test new new sponsorship um, levers that we might be able to pull and then have success and ultimately apply those to, to the bigger opportunities. And off the top of my head, I mean, I can think of just like in terms of new ways to go about sponsorship, like in the NBA bubble, you have like kind of the fan wall with Microsoft teams, uh, the NFL, um, as in the red zone, like the Bud Light can and things of that nature. Is there one example of that that you guys have either done or someone else in the industry that like sticks out to you um, that viewers would find very interesting? Oh man, I, I think um, not, not one specifically, but I do think a lot of this very quick innovation by the leagues and by many teams um, virtual placement, I think that's, that's a big one that's going to be more, I mean, it is out there in a mainstream way already, but I think, um, you're going to see that more and more um, because of you know there's there's more ability to do both in stadium physical signage when you think about a lot of the arenas the stadiums now blocking off the first several rows and that becomes either you know tarp signage or even LED signage you're going to see in many in many cases um, but then the virtual signage things that are superimposed you just have so much more flexibility um, and I think there's going to be a great creative capability that's, that that will be applied. Um, sports that probably exists in like you know the movies and tv more so when you think about kind of cgi i think a lot of that technology could be applied in, in pretty engaging ways not just for static signage but in, in engaging ways to augment and enhance uh game viewership uh the game viewership experience whether it's you know online or traditional broadcast and that's probably the thing that i've you know no one specific example but that's the area i think that has a lot of potential for for some fun innovation yeah. I was fortunate enough to sit in as a virtual fan on the NBA bubble and awesome. it was really cool. And, and you kind of just think about, I mean, that was Microsoft teams, but what brands can sponsor within that, like authentically and also what type of kind of offline um, like contests and sweepstakes can go into really sure. merging with that experience and making it not only kind of live in the stadium, but also live on digital or social media. Um, so it's something to look for. So no, yeah. another thing, Oh, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say, I mean, reinforce that point. I mean, that's absolutely correct. And it's something we're trying to do when you have such amazing tech partners with a lot of these teams and leagues, you know, think about Google, Amazon, Apple, um, Microsoft, the, you know, uh, there will be ways that you're going to connect the, the virtual engagement to the physical and potentially purchase behavior. Um, things like Amazon is, is huge for us. We obviously do have a pretty significant e-commerce business with Amazon and others. But when you think about the ability to link via Amazon e-commerce and the actual physical purchasing of our product um, with some of these experiences or offers digitally and, and you can dynamically change them based on the game or based on the sport or the, you know, the, what's happening in a game even, um, it's a pretty powerful tool. Another point I wanted to touch on is you guys have that new Bolt 24 um, brands coming out under the Gatorade umbrella. And I saw a very great partnership uh, with Damian Lillard, who's just such an exciting athlete, as well as Matthew Wolf in the golf space. What is it that you look for, um, either from a Pepsi perspective or kind of a Gatorade perspective, which lives under Pepsi, in terms of the athletes you partner with, like characteristics or just ability to reach fans? Yeah, I think it, um, it probably depends on a few macro factors. One, which is 
what are the brand objectives, right? When we think about what do we want to do, whether it's launching a new brand or growing trial or growing awareness or increasing velocity or sales volume in a certain region or even nationally or globally, it, it does start, everything starts, whether it's an athlete partnership or a league or team partnership, it starts with the brand and business objective. What are, what are we really trying to achieve? Then when you put that into the context of what can an athlete help us do, um, it is, you know, be the, be the face of a brand, be a spokesperson, be a credible, um, you know, avenue through which we can kind of espouse a brand message. So um, it starts with what what is the objective for the brand or the, you know, the business or, or marketing objectives, which will influence who we go after and, and the kind of deal and the assets we pursue. Um, and, and it, it does many times come down to reason relevant, right, with a certain target consumer. If we think a soccer athlete is going to give us the, the right target and right scale, you know, the right target consumer and the right scale, then we'll go after a soccer uh, athlete. Um, if it's more of a, in this case, Bolt24 and, and, and Damian Lillard, uh, obviously he's a super popular player, a very dynamic guy, um, and has, has an off-court lifestyle that Bolt24 wanted to tap into, which is the, the kind of the purpose for that, pro, you know, that product, is athletes need, uh, you know, rehydration and, and, uh, and, and kind of support off the court, off the field as well. So um, it really depends on those two factors, the, the, what, what scale and consumer target that the athlete can help us achieve um, and the brand objective to begin with. In the all-star lineup really uh, came together in the ready-to-play campaign um, over the pandemic. I mean, Zion Williamson, Bryce Harper, that was just a very invigorating um, advertisement, which is one of those that you remember when you see such powerful, um, not only athletes, but just figures, cultural figures come together. Time to play some baseball. Baseball? Yep. I can do baseball. We can play baseball? I'm in. If we can play anything. Four. I'm in. Seriously. Anything. Put me in, coach. Sign me up, dude. It's time to play. Woo! I'm not picky. At Gatorade is tremendous at doing this. Uh, hopefully, some of our other brands, we, we do it decently well from time to time. I think... Um, Anheuser Busch is also there, there's a handful of brands out there that are really good at and Nike is probably one of the best examples putting contextually relevant creative out there. So you you know you can't ignore the pandemic, you can't ignore the fact that sports have been upended. But how do you come up with a creative uh, brand idea that that you know um, capitalizes on that and and taps into how fans and how athletes are feeling? And I think that was a great example of doing that. We all we were ready to play. The athletes were ready to play, and therefore they they put out that great campaign capitalizing. I mean, and you guys do, from my perspective, a very good job with Mountain Dew um, across like the NBA All-Star Weekend, for example, they, they sponsor the three-point contest and there's kind of activations with fans and things of that nature on the side. And NBA All-Star Weekend is really a paradise for brand marketers, it seems. In, in this year, the league announced that they're postponing the game, um, at least in Indianapolis, I think until 2024. Is that, in your opinion, like an opportunity to try out new things or... How, how does that kind of hit PepsiCo from like a high level perspective in, in your team? Yeah, I mean, the NBA is such a great partner. We, we it's funny, um, Chicago All-Star Game this past February was like the last kind of thing before the pandemic hit. It was, we were all out there in Chicago, I guess a handful of weeks before the NBA shut down um, and then everything else did. So, and we love that event. We love the, the um, platform, the ownership that we have of the Mountain Dew three-point contest. And we, I think we started to figure out how to, activate that as a platform and a property not just at all-star but kind of trying to make the, the do three point a um a season-long platform we, we think there's real power there not just in the nba but also extending it to the WNBA. we think there's there's power in fully owning that platform and that space and fans minds um i think as we've pivoted to the you know given given coronavirus you know we're not sure if there will be an all-star game or if there will be a three-point contest if the, if the league does announce something we'll certainly lean in with them and activate if that's virtually or whatnot um, if there's not, you know, I think we'll we'll continue to try to own that platform in different unique ways. I think it just requires going back to the drawing board and say, okay, you know, we're going to pick up in 2021 maybe for that next season. But for this season, we still think there's tremendous value and power in, in the three-point platform in general. It just doesn't come to life at the All-Star game this year maybe. But um, we would probably end up pivoting quite a bit uh, virtually, digitally, socially. It really says something when the brand is synonymous with a property or a league. One area where I know you pay special attention to, and PepsiCo's done a great job, is with the halftime show. Um, every Super Bowl, I think since uh, 2015 or something, 
PepsiCo's really owned that. How is that process um, in choosing the, the entertainer if you're involved in that? And then what's it like to be having Jay-Z come into that mix? So I haven't been in the room with, with uh, himself, but um, we are part of the pro very much part of the process. It's kind of this three-headed, you know, triangle process of, of league, Pepsi, and now Rock Nation, with, and they've been a tremendous partner. I mean, they, they brought such talent and credibility and authenticity and creativity to the process and to the show itself. And I think we all saw that, you know, firsthand because last year in Miami with Shakira and Jayla was the first time it was kind of a Rock Nation produced show. Um, it was amazing. I think we all saw that. It was one of the best, so I think, good. ever, you know, depending some people, it was the best and I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to argue. It was certainly one of the best. Um, and I think they, and they've been tremendous partners and we look forward to this year as well. I think we're all pivoting, obviously, with this year, there might be some changes, um, but we're working through that. Um, but they, that's what they really brought, creativity, credibility, and authenticity, um, and a really fresh perspective on how we think about what the halftime show can bring and what it can be. Again, I think we're just scratching the surface. Last year was the first year we were all involved with Rock Nation. Um, this year, I think because of the you know the situation, we're having to pivot a little bit. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, the half time show planning really takes about 11 months of the year. It's crazy um, that you know in March every year, Super Bowl happens in February, and about the end of March we start talking about the next one. And and you know the artist selection is a big piece of that, and that usually happens you know in the summer months, mid year, give or take. Um, it's a long process, but uh, it is a almost full year process. And it's exciting from the artist selection announcement to crafting of the show itself um, and how we as a brand can, you know, our, our goal is always to how, how can we bring fans one step closer to the halftime show than they would have otherwise normally been, right? Or how can we lift up the curtain a little bit to give them a peek at how it comes together in terms of telling that story uh, of, how the artist is chosen and how the artist, you know, and, and the producers develop the show, um, what promotions and, and content can we bring and develop that really get fans one step closer. That's always the goal. And so I think when we do it right, um, we can give fans, you know, uh, that much better of an experience. Um, and it's just, a, it, it has become truly the, uh, the Super Bowl of entertainment in a way. The halftime show, if you think about it, is the Super Bowl of music, which happens to happen in the smack dab of the, the middle of the biggest sporting event every year. So it's just this really unique bullseye of, of pop culture that we love to be a part of. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I mean, that, that storytelling um, aspect that you mentioned is just a typical, typical consumer in, in myself. It's great to kind of have that access and see as much as, of that process as possible. So I'm happy to gain some insight here um, myself and, and for my viewers. Now, I'm just going to end off with a few quick hit questions because I know we're at time. But who's your prediction to win the Super Bowl? Ooh, tough one. Uh, listen, I think Kansas City is a tremendous team. They have a tremendous offense. Um, I, you know, not, not a betting man on this, but, uh, man, it's going to be hard. I feel like it's going to be hard to beat them in the postseason and I could very well see them in Tampa. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes is special. Who's, um, if you're allowed to or want to comment it, your favorite athlete that you've worked with at Pepsi? Uh, I mean, we, we do have a tremendous amount of excellent, amazing athlete partners. Um, I don't know if I can pick just one, but I will say, going back to the halftime, I thought Shakira and Jayla were just so tremendous to work with. They were so accommodating to us as a brand. Um, and they obviously put on a tremendous show. I think I really enjoyed working with, with them and their teams a little bit on that and just, you know, the show that they put on. I'll, I'll avoid that question strategically. I don't want to choose one athlete. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want Zion coming at you. <laughs> um, no, we love him, but yeah, definitely don't want, want to pick one over the other. Yeah, and lastly, any advice for just those looking to get into sports marketing? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'll say applies to a lot of things, but I say it with a specific context of sport, which is two things. One, um, you know, I say this more maybe geared toward a student audience, but um, man, take, learn all you can about non-sports stuff, honestly, if, if you know, economics, negotiations, finance, um, all these things play into whatever you're going to do ultimately, but in sports for sure. I mean, the amount of, I'm not a lawyer, but I feel like I should have my JD with all the contracts and all the negotiations I've done at this point. Um, but you have to understand finance. You have to understand real estate because it's so funny. Many of the deals we do now are not just stadium and pouring rights deals, but they're like, you know, the Cowboys with the star, they have retail and commercial development complexes associated with them. And so you have to at least know enough about the finances and real estate and legal stuff to be dangerous to navigate through these, these negotiations and contracts. Um, so learn, learn all you can and engage 
in, in the non-sports stuff because that will ultimately make you a better sports marketer is number one. And then two, um, really be open to, to a non-linear career path. Like if you say, hey, I really want to be in you know, music marketing, or I really want to be in sports marketing, be open to different ways to ultimately get there. And I, I use the analogy, um, it's a little outdated these days, but you know, use a compass and not a map. Use a compass to start your career because you can kind of set the general direction and then follow that direction, understanding that you might kind of zig and zag a little bit to ultimately get where you want to go um, and be open to those tangential uh, career paths and career moves. Um, I wanted to be in sports right off the bat coming out of school, but, um, you know, went to Pepsi because I knew I or thought I could get there eventually. But the first five years of my career were spent on, on the brand side, having almost nothing to do with sports. Um, but it ultimately did get me to where I needed to be. And I think I'm a, a better sports marketer because I was a brand marketer first in that regard. So um, 2020, it's easy to say that, you know, hindsight, but, um, you know, be open to those nonlinear career paths, ultimately get where you want to be. All right, everybody really want to thank you guys all for tuning in. That's seven episodes in to pencil it in. I hope everybody has really enjoyed the content I'm putting out. That's it for before the Christmas holiday. We'll be back after, have a few big interviews lined up with people in the radio broadcasting space, Len Casper, who just transitioned from the Chicago Cubs to the White Sox, where he'll be doing radio, and Mark Silverman of ESPN Chicago Radio as well. So I hope you guys are all very excited for that. Wishing everybody a safe and happy holidays, and we'll talk soon.